Well, I promised a few people that I saw today that we were going to light up the room. And I have to tell you that these three men did a wonderful job. I wanted to cover a couple of things that as the uh, moderator I have the uh, authority to do, and I wanted to make sure that they were clarified for the audience. For those of you who are not doing epidemiology on a regular basis, um, Jim, would you mention uh, a couple of things with regards to what relative risk means, what those numbers were in that slide 10 where you had all the studies that compared to yours and didn't show any effect? And the second thing that I would like you to uh, clarify for everybody is the importance of confidence in for intervals and, and the range of confidence intervals when you're looking at these uh, kinds of studies. Okay, yes. Uh, obviously, I had to go through this fast. Uh, the relative risks are um, the, in, the increase for 10 micrograms per cubic meter increase. In other words, if the level goes from 10 to 20 and the relative risk goes from 1.0 to 1.05, you have a 5% increase due to a 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in air, air pollution. And the confidence intervals are, again, a statistical measurement that the result that you've um, found uh, is 95% likely to be within the range of the lower and uh, upper confidence interval in, in s sort of simplified terminology. And uh, this can be studied further by uh, going into some of the cited documents. That's basically, I think, what you want. Uh, what, what caught my eye was, though, that a number of those studies had confidence intervals that included one. And people here know, need to know, that means the study doesn't mean a damn thing. Okay? Well, it's consistent with no effect. And, and basically, they all... That's a nice way to say They it. all uh, were consistent with no effect in that particular slide. Uh, Charles, you, you didn't, I think it was your slide that had it, but you didn't talk about precautionary principle, and I think everybody in this room needs to have that concept in their head and understand what it's about. Yeah, my, my presentation was a test. If you could read what was up there and hear what I said. <laughs> but I did allude to it. That, that's where the concept is that any amount of a substance is poisonous or injurious to health in any amount. And therefore, uh, why take a chance? We better not use something if it is a chance of harming us. So if, if two ounces are poisonous, one ounce might be poisonous. That's a linear effect blended into there. But it's just basically saying we are going to be so cautious about everything uh, that we are going to test it before we let you use it. It's sort of an insurance policy before you know there's a problem. Does that sound reasonable? <laughs> you got it. Um, what I want you to understand is that, that in Europe, the precautionary principle is now the dominant way to make policy. People in Europe at this point don't want any risk. It's like a bunch of moms who can't stand the idea of their kid being out of their sight. Okay, so that's a... The last point I want to make about the slides that I saw was uh, also with the regards to Charles' slides. He mentioned the fact that some guys, you know, got to love them. They've always got something to do. They're working 24-7, make that money that the EPA is sending them. And they said that warming is causing asthma. I would like you to know something. Asthma goes up in the winter. It goes down in the summer. Okay? So they didn't even have the right to get their ink on some piece of paper. But they were saying something that helped to push the, the agenda. And so what they, what they said was anything that would work, anything that they thought would work on an ignorant public. But we know, as physicians, that warm is easier on asthmatics. OK? Asthma goes down. There's another interesting thing to consider. When do you think during the year that ozone goes up? In the summer. So we've got an asthma trend that's down 
in spite of the fact the EPA says it ought to be going up because ozone is higher in the summer. And they also say, well, asthma is caused by global warming, but it goes down in the summer. So. from Denver. I want to preface my question by saying um, I'm in health care and I just took care of a poor lady from Mexico that has end-stage pulmonary hypertension from years of breathing in fire smoke because she cooked over a fire. She wasn't exposed to ozone. But anyway, um, I was going to ask you, do you know of any studies at all that make any attempt in some of these advocates uh, to make any attempt to control for confounding factors? We don't see it in the climate change literature making any attempt to address the confounding factors of hurricanes and volcanoes. What about uh, in public health epidemiology? Any that you know of? Controlling for smoking, uh, lack of exercise, these known health uh, factors that impact uh, longevity and, and disease. There, there are a couple of comments there. Yes, there are all kinds of mathematical corrections for factors. Uh, but you have to keep in mind, people are looking for an effect of 1 or 2 percent. 1 or 2 percent in very noisy data is incredibly difficult to pick up. So yes, they correct for this and that, but if they leave anything out, if they leave anything out, that can introduce a bias into the process and lead to this 1 percent, 2 percent kind of effect that you go on. So yes, they make mathematical corrections. Do they have every correction in their model? The answer is clearly no. Uh, most of the things, based on our data, we think there's no effect. And so if you see an effect, it's probably because a confounding factor was left out of the process, and that's what gave rise to this 1 to 2 percent. I'd just like to add, that, again, the underlying problem is that we uh, or other independent scientists have no way of even checking what these people have done. And so, um, you know, we're really stuck in a very bad hole right now. I would like to add this. As a dummy, I really don't do the kind of things that these guys do, Stan and, and Jim. I can look at an abstract that's published by the EPA on epidemiology, and I can tell you from the abstract whether it's junk science or not. I look for one thing. What kind of relative risk did they find in their study? And if the relative risk is minimal, in other words, if it's not robust enough to, to pass the test of Bradford Hill on what's toxic, it's not proof of anything. And they admitted it under oath in a trial that we filed against them to stop the human experiments. Their senior research scientist at the University of North Carolina said under oath, epidemiology doesn't prove causation at all. Let's have some questions. Yep. Out here. Uh, I apologize, I came in late. I wasn't able to get here earlier for this, but I wanted to ask Dr. Baddick a question. This may have been covered, I don't know. You may have seen the, the op-ed in the Richmond Times Dispatch, I think it was last week, where I think it was a pediatrician wrote a big column about the evils of uh, global warming in terms of hay fever, allergies, that she connected that uh, global warming was causing more growth of plants, increased plant growth, et cetera, and so pollens and, and allergies were increasing, and this was a threat to our children. Uh, do you want to comment on that concept and what, how relevant or appropriate it is? These, these types of claims are always stitched together. When you, you, can, you can say you're more mold, more this, more that, but it's all speculation. So it's, it's, you know, it, it becomes a crying point for people looking for something to uh, cry out. It's the children, it's, it's the grandchildren and whatnot, and yet it's very difficult, as my first slide showed, tried to show, it's difficult to con uh, contradict these claims because you really can't do these studies. So you have to look at the overall uh, facts and the bigger picture and extrapolate backwards. 
And that really doesn't follow A, A from B. I mean, you can make that claim, but it doesn't mean that happens. And it could be that there are other confounding factors as well which would uh, uh, negate that. So it, it's an unknown. Uh, hi, I'm Howard Hyde, AmericanThinker.com. Uh, this comment is uh, intended to embarrass Dr. Enstrom, uh, who may be too modest uh, to uh, let, let the people know here that he was, in fact, is it not true that you were fired from your job at UCLA uh, precisely for uh, coming up with uh, scientific results that did not please the uh, establishment at that uh, university and that you had to f fight your way back to get your job back? That's one of the more unpleasant aspects of this type of research, and that's one reason I put up the uh, uh, slides with Vavilov and Lysenko. At least I was not killed. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Justin Myra, and I work for Collegians for Constructive Tomorrow, and I interact with a lot of college students who are afraid of the health risks of pollution from global warming. However, many of them uh, smoke cigarettes, among other things. <laughs> and I'm curious what the fine particulate matter would be in... <laughs> um, like, what would be the fine particulate matter in cigarettes or other things, if you know what I mean? And what would be the health risks of those compared to the perceived health risks of global warming? Uh, let me comment here. Uh, you're all deputized now, okay? I have a network of, I have a network of people that send me crazy papers. So a person sent me a, a paper that described a health study of people that went to smoking dens. They had a name for it. I don't know what it was. No one's dying in those dens. How many of you have seen a person walking down the street, take a deep drag, and then just fall over dead? It takes many, many years for a very small fraction of the smokers to have adverse health effects. Now, smoking is infinitely more intense than what you're getting in the air. So just walking around in the air, taking a drag on a cigarette every now and then, you have no risk, no practical, no practical risk. And keep in mind, we're a little overboard, so you guys, we want to give you 30 minutes to go before the reception, so. Um, That's right, I'll cook for you. Yeah. <laughs> Randy, Randall. Look, first, Dr. John, thanks. This is the most important panel here. This should have been first up. Every regulation, every proposal is based on health effects. The endangerment finding, social cost of carbon is all about public health and welfare. Everybody in this room has to have at least one slide out of this in every presentation you give anywhere, anytime. One slide, okay? There are a couple in here that would work. The most important thing is you start with that slide, then you do all your other model stuff, your data stuff, but they have to begin with there are no health effects. Now, my question for Dr. Young. Uh, I think there was only one paper that you pointed to that had any indication of a response to temperature. I think that was a Cox paper. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, temperature at both extremes is a killer. Uh, if the temperatures are too cold, that's bad for you. If the temperatures are too high, that's bad for you. Uh, there are a number of papers that look at temperature. The Cox paper is one. I just picked up uh, one of my deputies sent me one the other day. Uh, there was a heat wave in Europe, I think in 2003, 35,000 statistical deaths associated with that heat wave. When I looked at the data for London, I got the usual high deaths in winter, low deaths in summer, and then there was an enormous spike in the data. I think it was August uh, 2003. And the daily deaths jumped by 240 deaths. You don't need a statistician to pick that up. 35,000, so temperature is, a, is an important factor. One factor that's usually not in the papers is we've moved to air conditioning. 
So a lot of people now are not exposed to the dangers they were exposed to 20 years ago because they have air conditioning. And yet most of the papers that you read on the epidemiology of air pollution do not include air conditioning as a covariate to help adjust what's going on. The place is just littered with uh, all kinds of things that, that make the, most of the papers you read uh, literally junk science. A uh, couple other things. Remember there were a bunch of people that died in Chicago around the same time, big heat wave. Bad housing, no air conditioning. In the north, uh, houses and buildings without air conditioning are, are a pretty common thing. And the uh, bad problem in France was directly related to another uh, uniquely French uh, phenomenon. They all go on vacation in August. And so they left the old folks who were disabled uh, back home without m as much attention. So a lot of them suffered from just the change in the temperature that caused them to be unable to acclimate. Acclimation means that in the south, Heat waves don't kill people. Uh, Roger Koopman, Montana Public Service Commission. Uh, great panel, by the way. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to, oh, I don't know, throw, throw you just a little bit of a change up here. Not a curveball, but a, but a change up. Uh, we know that those of us who are, uh, who are exposing counterfeit science are going to be held to a, a different standard by the liberal media. But self-examination is a good thing. I'm going to direct this at Dr. Engstrom first, but any of you can swing at this one. Um, do you feel there's any problem within our ranks? A any areas where there's some carelessness, where there's some bad data being put out, uh, where there's um, areas that we need to kind of clean up our, our own act or police our own ranks, or however you want to put it? Um, and, and what do we do about that? Well, I think the emotions are high um, on both sides, and um, I don't want to try to get into specifics, but the best way of resolving these is to have a dialogue with all points of view, preferably in the same room at the same time, and that way you can sort out the, the problems, and that is not possible right now, as I've tested and um, as many others have have found, the the camps are just at war with one another, and there there probably are some some issues that on our side that might not be expressed properly, but I believe that at least um, we are more receptive to trying to work with the other side than the other side is work, wanting to work with us. So that's about all I could say at this point. On. I'll quickly comment, one of, the things, one of the things we did was we ran our analysis in lots of different ways. We set up a whole scheme of things that could be changed in the analysis, and we wanted to look at the effect of those factors on the analysis results. Uh, we used the cloud and we ran a total of over 78,000 different statistical analyses. The other thing that we did right from the beginning, we said to the three statisticians working on it, we have to be able to document exactly what we did. We have to be able to document how you move from the raw data to the analysis data file. We have to be able to document how the analysis was actually done. And then finally, we have to provide to anyone that asks, we have to provide the analysis code for how we did our work and we have to provide the data set that we used. So our defense is we are trying to do transparent and open science. So if someone comes to me and says, I don't believe what the heck you did, they have our analysis files, they have our data files, let them belly up to the computer and do their own analysis. And that's exactly what we cannot get from the other side. We're going to do one final question over here. Yeah, I just think we need to answer the question that was asked earlier from the uh, CFAC Collegian about how much PM a smoker might inhale. Um, you know, EPA says that any level of PM 2.5 can kill you within hours. Outside these very doors, the amount of PM in the air is about 10 millionths of a gram per cubic meter. 
it, and that's about what you're going to breathe in an hour, about 10 millionths of a gram. Um, a smoker is going to breathe somewhere between 10,000 and 40,000 millionths of a gram in five minutes. Okay. If you go to a hookah bar, you can be exposed to 100 cigarettes worth of tobacco smoke in an evening. Someone who smokes a joint, unfiltered marijuana joint, will get 180,000 millionths of a gram of PM2.5 in just a few minutes. So, you know, EPA is out there saying that any level of 2.5 will kill you within hours, but, you know, we are, you know, in Colorado and other states that are pushing medical marijuana, I mean, this is debunking this on a daily basis. If you know smokers, okay, they debunk this on a constant basis. So it's important to keep these levels in mind. Thank you, John. Uh, that's uh, Steve Malloy. He's the one that founded this thing, and most of us, at least two people, at least two people on this panel learned a lot from the books that Steve has written. And over here in the corner is Jerry Arnett. Jerry is a pulmonologist from West Virginia who, who came, in case you got any questions about black lung, he happens to be the expert. <laughs> 